Hi everyone. How are you all doing? Quiet but smiling. That's a good start. Okay. Um, so broadly speaking, the format for tonight's event, we're going to have our three speakers each talk about a specific topic relevant to women and secularism. The first topic is on reproductive rights, which will be talked about by Naomi. And we'll cover things such as the choices that we make about our own bodies, whether they're our own or if the state has a right to interfere. When does life begin and who decides that in, pub in public pu uh, policy? And should you be able to start a family with anyone that you choose? And what is a woman's role within reproductive rights? Then second, we'll come to Peter Blackos, who will speak with us about workplace equality and religious <coughs> exemptions, such as should there be exemptions in employment of religious and non-religious people for certain jobs? How does religion affect women's progression in the workplace? And third, we have Ahlam Ahram speaking with us about Sharia law and religious tribunals, uh, on what values ought our legal system to be based, how does this work increasingly <coughs> affect a multicultural society? So the format, broadly speaking, will be a 10-minute introduction, followed by five minutes <coughs> of panel response and discussion, and then we're going to open it up to the floor for about 10-15 minutes, and you guys get to ask whatever questions you like. Um, so I'll quickly introduce Naomi. I'm sure many of you have met her before. Head of Public Affairs at British Humanist Association. She's previously worked for the Ministry of Justice and has been with the BHA since 2007. Most recently, we will have seen their biggest campaign uh, to do with the census, which is, if you're not religious, for God's sake, say so. We went out flying for them uh, last week. And she works on international issues with the European Humanist Federation as a director, and has awards from University of Manchester and the LSE for her academic achievements in the fields of social policy and gender. Right, <laughs> over to you. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's been quite some time since I studied gender, so this is very much uh, not uh, grounded in academia, but just my own thoughts. <coughs> um, when I was um, advertising this event today, I tweeted about it, um, posing the question, do women need secularism? And almost immediately, Taslima Nazreen, who's quite a prolific tweeter, um, the Bangladeshi feminist, humanist, scholar uh, and activist currently living in exile for her criticisms of Islam and religion, uh, more generally replied and she said women need secularism more than anybody else and I think that's quite a powerful statement uh, particularly in response to the question posed this evening it says not only do women need secularism that they need it more than men do and although I'm only going to talk about probably about 10 minutes I think what I say will it will agree with Taslima's assertion um, I was particularly pleased to be asked to, to speak at this event um, as although the BHA often works with feminists and women's organisations on a range of issues, it's not often that I get to speak of feminist issues directly. Um, and as such, I'm going to take the opportunity to speak from a more personal uh, perspective um, and not necessarily uh, the views of the BHA um, at all times. Um, however, because the BHA is the largest organisation working for a secular state in the UK, much of what I say, particularly in the later discussion, I imagine, will be drawn from the detailed and wide-ranging and expert work that we undertake on secularism and the related issues. So I've been asked to talk just for a few minutes about the issue of reproductive rights in the context of the discussion we're having this evening. Um, and it's such a huge area that I can't hope to uh, cover even a fraction of it. Um, but I am going to talk a bit about why reproductive rights are not only um, often at the centre of feminist debates, but also humanist secularist and religious ones too. And I'll argue that secularism does not guarantee women full rights uh, and control over their reproduction, um, but that it is a necessary prerequisite because it creates and supports a right to enabling space. I'll also make the point that in Britain today, the biggest threat to women's reproductive rights does come from religion, and so that we need more secularism, a proper separation of church and state. And I'll also agree with Taslima that women need it more than men. Uh, if you hadn't guessed, I'm a feminist. Um, and although feminists in general support equality between the sexes, there are many different schools of feminism and different approaches, and quite often diff disagreements between different feminist approaches and, and analyses are often more virulent than those between feminists and anti-feminists. Um, I would describe myself as a radical feminist, um, a position that's pretty unfashionable these days. Um, 
And by radical feminist, I mean that I believe in sex oppression. I believe that women as a sex are oppressed by men as a sex. And I believe that they are oppressed on grounds of their sex and their gender. And I also believe that, yeah, that oppression is universal. I do not think... I do, I do think it's not only possible to make universal claims about men and women, but that it's actually important to do so. And by universal, I mean that, they, that we can say things for certain that link women as women across class, race and national boundaries. For example, it is a fact that in every country in the world, women, on average, earn less than men, on average. And why is it important, why is that kind of idea important in the context of uh, discussion? Because I think you cannot make an argument in favour of women needing secularism without A, seeing that as a universal claim, uh, and B, uh, and B, you cannot make an argument in favour of women needing secularism without seeing that there are systems universally oppressive of women, such as religion, that can be mitigated or negated in some way by having a secular state or religion-neutral public policy. So I'm going to talk a bit about reproductive rights in particular. I'm going to um, uh, read the opening paragraphs of an essay written in 1969, uh, which I absolutely think still applies today. Uh, and the essay is by Lucinda Sisler, and it's entitled Unfinished Business, Birth Control and Women's Liberation. And it's from this really amazing 1970 anthology of writings of the women's living movement. Um, and she says, because women have wounds and bear children, and because technical control of the reproductive function has always been imperfect and still is today, society has ultimately defined women as childbearer. That is, as she relates to children and to men, rather than as an individual. And since her basic function has been to bear children, whatever extra activities the culture and the economy have allowed her to pursue, anything that alters social control over her reproductive capacities is deeply and fundamentally threatening to societal and individual psyches. Different reproductive roles are the basic dichotomy in humankind and have been used to rationalise all the other ascribed differences between women and men. And to justify the oppression, all the oppression that women have suffered. That was quite extreme, I think, quite, uh, for some people would think. Um, but I think that that perspective shows and it suggests that universally and historically, a lack of control over their reproduction has been a fundamental aspect of women's oppression by men. And I think that we can see that in many countries and societies, especially those which do not have good access to contraception or access to education about fertility, that women are firmly and repressively bound by their reproductive roles. We can also see that in richer, highly educated Western countries particularly, increased control over contraception, fertility and a growth in women's rights and control over their own reproduction, including greater access to safe and legal abortions, have been a key feature of women's liberation and emancipation. And secularism, I would argue, has played its part in women's emancipation in relation to reproductive rights. Growing secularism in society has helped to secure rights against the will of the church or religion more generally. Religion is problematic for women. Religion being inherently sex oppressive, it is, after all, a product of patriarchal sex oppressive societies. But the force in our society by the secular enlightenment ideals has freed us to a great extent. In Britain today, our politics and society have been hugely influenced by secularism. Yes, we have an established church. Yes, uniquely among Western democracies, we have bishops sitting as a right in the House of Lords. And yes, a third of our state-maintained schools have a religious character, and the list does go on. But conversely, we've also got one of the most non-religious and effectively secular populations in the world. Our laws are made by a democratic parliament, and we have a robust justice system which in recent months has shown itself to be firmly secularist in its outlook, with high court judges using openly secularist arguments in their judgments on cases dealing with alleged uh, cases of Christian discrimination. And we're signed up to secular, national and international human rights treaties. And apart from the, uh, some significant exceptions for, for religion, everyone is generally equal in the eyes of the law, regardless of their religion or non-religious belief. <coughs> And in that context, women also have increasing rights over their re reproduction. But we don't have full control. We must still see two doctors to assess our mental fitness before we're allowed to access abortion services. 
Women are often prescribed long-term contraceptives by doctors such as implants or injections, which may not be the best method for us, but they are prescribed because women are not seen as being capable of making rational choices over their own fertility, and we can't be trusted. Condoms are still in control of men. When women go to bed with men, how often is it their choice whether or not to use them? However, realistically, the mechanisms are in place for women to control their fertility at least to some extent, not only with the widely available and free contraceptive pill, which revolutionised women's lives and continues to free us from our biological design, but women do have rights and the vote, and most women work and are educated, and so most are capable of independence as well. So why then, if we've made so much progress in these areas, would we need secularism particularly anyway? Although it isn't only religious groups and individuals who are seeking to reverse the advances that our society, that men and women, have made in the area of women's rights, it is religious groups that are most vociferous against that progress. It is true that there are non-religious people who are not pro-choice, who do not believe women should be able to access legal abortions, or at least not after 12 weeks of pregnancy, or at least after not serious amounts of counselling. But they are not the people lobbying our IPs day after day, requesting a change in the law. It is groups working from and motivated by a specific religious outlook that are making some gains with their anti-choice rhetoric. It is those groups who go into our schools, often pretending that they are not religious, in order to give them a foothold and an entry into those schools, and then bombarding children with misinformation and lies and horrifying pictures and, and descriptions of bloody fetuses and so on. Shock tactics. They believe that the use of contraception is morally wrong, and so wish to ensure that, uh, that either no pe young people are taught about contraception, or that they are told that using it is evil, or that they must be abstinent. They wish our young people to be ignorant about their own bodies and their rights, because they wish to enforce their, enforce their narrow and their ignorant religious viewpoint as mandatory on others. It is not only the religious who, op who oppose fertility treatments such as IVF, but it is the well-funded religious lobby that seeks to retard scientific progress in that area, as it does with so many other areas of scientific and particularly ethical advance. And as I've set out, it's far from only being religion that sees and treats uh, and has an interest in maintaining a very specific role for women where their sex is seen as justification uh, for all sorts of unequal treatment of grounds of their gender. But it is religions which are powerful in keeping and maintaining that view of women as dependent on and distinctly unequal to men. Uh, another interesting way that women is, uh, religion is undermining women's rights, reproductive rights, is the increasing occasions that we're seeing professionals using religious objections and refusing to provide services to which women are otherwise entitled because they don't personally like it. It offends their personal sensibilities. So, for example, the Muslim pharmacist who refuses to give the woman the morning after pill when she goes in and requests it. Or the Catholic doctor who refers a woman seeking abortion to a Catholic rather than a family planning clinic to discuss her choices. Because these are about individual transactions, it's harder to police and public policies, but it can be legislated against. And this is where I think secularism really comes into its own, and arguments for secularism um, uh, are robust and necessary in order to ensure and promote women's rights. Unfortunately, we cannot rely on the force of feminist arguments alone because our unequal position means that they will often be overlooked, negated or ignored by those in a position to change things. But the secularist argument, and in fact the human rights argument, is important too. That says that people have a right to believe what they want, but when they're providing public services or performing public functions, their rights to manifest those beliefs are limited. And the rights and needs of the patient and service user must come first. Those, such as the doctor or the pharmacist, or indeed the teacher, have a duty to treat people equally and provide services in a non-discriminatory way. Just as their rights believe what they want is respected, so too must they respect the dignity, worth and rights of others they're serving, even if they don't particularly like it. I think there can be room in society to accommodate serious ethical objections, not just ones coming from religion, but moral and ethical objections, such as actually performing abortions. But I also think that those must never be at the, at the expense of a woman's right to access abortion or any detriment to her personally. 
to be a bit stronger, I don't care actually what, pe what the religious beliefs of doctors, scientists, politicians, teachers, pharmacists, counsellors and so on are. It's not really any of my business. But if their religious beliefs interfere with the proper function of their public service work, if they are unable to contain their religious fervour, then they should look for another job. So to conclude, I believe that the best feminism is one that is mainstreamed by secularism, that is supported by the secularist position. I think the two are actually intertwined and interlinked in so many ways that their coexistence may not be apparent, but it is there. I would argue that when we make feminist arguments for greater control over our own bodies, they are implicitly, at least, secularist arguments too. Do women need secularism? Yes. Otherwise, we will never realise our ideal of escaping universal sex oppression or, in day, or indeed just the day-by-day day chipping away at our rights by religion. Is secularism good for women? Yes. But I'd also make the case that the secular state, where the state is neutral on matters of religion or belief, mm. and people are treated equally regardless of belief, would be a much reduced state if women were not equal to men, fully emancipated, with, and with control over their reproduction. Feminism is good for secularism too. I didn't want to stop the flow there because it was such a good speech, um, but we've run to 15 minutes. So if I can have a quick, that's all right, it was very interesting, a quick five minute panel response and discussion. And then we're going to have five minutes so that we keep to time from the audience, so discussions and questions. So if you can think of anything that you'd like to raise, uh, meanwhile, the panel. You start. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> no, my experience is different, to be honest. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I was raised in a different society where uh, it's a better society, 100%, and my fight for uh, my rights were absolutely different. So. Uh, it's just, uh, to be honest, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't bother me. What bothers me is that in that, in that frame of culture and religion, I was denied my equal right. And that's, that's the main thing for me. So my outlook for these things are a little different. But I do believe that a woman is, uh, is, is the only master of her body, whatever she wants to do. Please, you go ahead. Um, I'll leave it. Reproductive rights are absolutely at the center of, um, of women's liberation. Um, and when you were describing, when you were giving your talk, Naomi, it reminded me when I was a, with many students here, when I was a student, one of the things a number of us did was show support to the first freestanding non-governmental abortion clinic in the province of Ontario, the second in Canada, that was opened by uh, Dr. Henry Morgenthaler where the battle for the clinic was fought literally in the streets, that we would have to hold 24-hour vigils in front of the clinic because primarily Christians opposing women's rights um, to, to control their own bodies would threaten to firebomb the clinic, would pelt eggs at women trying to enter the clinic, and we would literally have to circle, uh, circle the clinic to, to protect it. So it was, a, it was a battle that was quite literally fought on, on the streets to, to protect that freedom. Um, you described yourself as a radical feminist, and I describe myself from that perspective as a radical libertarian feminist. Um, in terms of abortion, uh, uh, certainly abortion rights, um, and the AGM for <coughs> abortion rights is coming up very soon. For those of you who, who are members, please do attend. Um, uh, without, um, without the two doctors having to sign, on demand, um, without any restriction whatsoever. And I would extend that to say, the eighth month, 28th day, um, the woman's control of her own body pre, um, preempts all the other social controls and sort of needs <coughs> that society might want to be, what might want to impose. It's a dangerous path to go down to say that society has a claim, a prior claim over to an unborn child. Um, next thing you know, society will have a claim over our kidneys or our lungs, or any other bits of our body that they might want to dip their hands in. It's just an absolutely dangerous place to go. Can I come back? All I remember about this is as a young girl, my uncle's wife, she kept getting pregnant, and uh, the only place where they gave contraceptives, where I come from, 
was from a, a small convent run by nuns. And she would go to them to get the contraceptive because, you know. But my uncle, he went and he fought with them and it was a big fight. And my, my auntie ended up with 16 children. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can imagine, you know, what does it mean to, 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 to stop women from, I mean, from having uh, contraceptives. And unfortunately that uh, uh, somehow, without tarnishing anybody, somehow in the religion it is, it's confirmed that uh, increase population as much as you can because this is the way we are going to, I'm going to be proud of you on the day of eternity. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a big battle for, the, for women in the Middle East as well to convince religious clerics that it, and the, the situation changed, there is no doubt, but it's still, even for instance, like a place in, like Egypt, they can't keep affording having five or six families, which, which is considered okay, you know. It's, it's accepted. I mean, you know, with the level of poverty and uh, the increase of population and not the ability, the, the, the absence of ability of sustainable development, sustainable, uh, yeah, development to, 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 to take care of such an increase. Of course, the country is going to remain backward and on the receiving end. Right. Okay, so we've reached about 20 minutes. So if I can ask any of you if you would like to ask a question, please, yes, go ahead. Um, <laughs> um, you mentioned that you thought there might be some scope for allowing doctors to opt out of performing abortions. <coughs> but you seem to have a different view on handing out the morning after pill. Why do you think you draw the line there, given that in both cases, I'm sure they would say that it stems from a deep-rooted ethical concern. What do you think is the distinction between the two? Uh, it's a really difficult question, actually. Um, and I think that, I mean, where we can start is where we are already in law, um, where there is very, in law, there's only very, very narrow objections that are allowed if doctors don't have, doctors with serious objections don't have to perform abortion. Um, and I think that they're, I mean, it's not, it's not an easy thing to decide, actually. Um, and I think I'd probably start from there, and I don't want to go too much further than what we've already got, what we've already legislated for in law, I think. Um, and I think a part of the deal of, allow, of, 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 of the Abortion Act and so on was to have that particular provision in it. There is um, a distinction in the sense that one is abortive and one isn't, um, so that if you uh, believe that life begins at um, conception, um, if you believe that, then, um, then when you abort fetus and you believe that you know, that's murder, it's not quite the same actually with the morning after because it's not abortive. Um, so it's actually a different thing anyway. So I think if people wanted to look at it in that way, i.e. if you genuinely believe you're committing murder, it's quite a different thing from another act which you may not like. But I agree that the line is very difficult and it's something that the BHA is working closely with our philosophers group on as well as medical ethicists and lawyers and so on and all to, to actually try to get a real robust um, policy position actually, a, a, a useful policy position for us to work out these very difficult areas because those kind of ethical concerns are ones that have troubled ethicists for, um, you know, for, for decades and will continue to. There's no, there's no, there is no easy answer, but I would say the situation pra pragmatically that we have at the moment is that it, the, the law makes a distinction between what some people might consider murder and other things. 